Okay, uh, welcome everyone uh, to the uh, first seminar of this term of this year of our Land Nature series. It's great to see so many. We, we had limited registrations online, so we thought we weren't quite sure what the turnout would be for the first uh, seminar, but you've got to get a very full room. <laughs> So congratulations. Uh, before I hand over to my colleague Lisa to introduce the uh, speaker, uh, I'll just mention a few of the other seminars we've got lined up this term, all of them on Fridays. Uh, uh, next week, we have Miguel Araujo, uh, uh, who's a distinguished global biogeographer, and he's going to be talking about embracing complexity to understand and predict the consequences of environmental changes and biodiversity. Uh, the week after, we have Eleanor Lazo Chavero from the Autonomous University of Mexico, on land, tenure, deforestation, and monocultures, menaces to food and territorial justice. The week after, we have Miles Silliman from Lake Forest University in North Carolina on the impacts of small-scale mining on the tropical rainforests. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, and then there's various other, I'll just mention one other as a highlight. On the 23rd of February, we have Tim Smith, the founder of the Eden Project, on the transformative art of kissing frogs. So, uh, so do do come along to all of those. There's the various other ones we're confirming uh, in, in there as well. So uh, now I'd like to hand over to, to Lisa to introduce our speaker, but also just to mention afterwards, we've got some drinks at the back uh, and uh, and snacks. So do feel free, free to linger uh, in formal conversations afterwards. Great. Uh, thanks, Yvinda. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, Lisa Wedding. I'm an associate professor here in the department, and I'm uh, also academic director of BCM program. So great to see a lot of the BCM students here. Uh, so I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Tundi Agardi. We are lucky to have her as a distinguished visiting fellow at Worcester College all term. Um, and so Tundi, um, I, I also have the pleasure of working with Tundi uh, on the editorial board of a, a new nature journal, Ocean Sustainability. Um, so she's the founder of Sound Seas, which is a, a Washington based, uh, Washington DC based group working at the nexus of science and policy. Um, and to focus on advancing marine conservation around the globe. And so in this, in this particular role that she has, um, she assists NGOs, government agencies, and multilaterals with conservation planning and project implementation uh, and program evaluation. So uh, formerly, Dr. Agardi was a senior scientist at WWF, uh, directing its marine work there. And then uh, she was later, uh, she later founded Conservation International's uh, Global Marine Program. She received her PhD in Biological Sciences uh, and Masters in Marine Affairs from the University of Rhode Island in the US and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Uh, so today, Tundi is going to be talking to us about restoration and uh, conservation of coastal ecosystems. So let's give her a warm welcome and our attention. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Vinda, uh, for the opportunity to speak. Um, I have nowhere near as an exciting talk as Tim Smith's about kissing frogs, <laughs> but I hope to uh, be a little bit provocative um, today and talk about what's required to restore coastal and marine uh, ecosystems around the world. if I can advance this way. So the marine world is wondrous and full of uh, life, teeming with life and biodiversity. And it's a place that we, all of us very much value, but it is a place that is being rapidly transformed all around the world. The transformation is occurring not just because of the way we use the sea, deployed its resources, um, transform coastal areas um, to develop them for our own use, uh, but also the way that we deal with land and fresh water, because ultimately the oceans are the sink for everything we do on the planet. And much of the activity in watersheds will negatively affect coastal areas um, as much as the activities that we do at sea, such as fishing and mining. Oops, <laughs> I'm being too, too eager with my thumb here. Uh, against the backdrop of all of these pressures that we ex exert simultaneously and cumulatively on the sea, 
we have, of course, global climate change, which is causing sea level rise in some places, causing water to warm, causing increased incidence of storms, um, causing ocean acidification. So all of these things together have resulted in a situation where the oceans are no longer in many places that wondrous, beautiful, awe-inspiring place, but are places that are highly degraded um, and places where we're seeing uh, ecosystems approach points of no return, approach points where regime shifts can take place that are ext extremely difficult to recover from. At the same time, we're creating less and less space, uh, providing less and less space for coastal communities that so depend on ocean resources uh, to utilize those resources. So we're cramming people into smaller spaces with fewer resources, creating opportunities for conflict. You would think that because we live on a watery planet, uh, that the oceans are so big uh, that these impacts are minimal um, and aren't yet affecting the functioning of the, the, the processes that exist in marine and coastal systems. But unfortunately, that is not true. And the reason for that is that the coastal areas are the ones where there's the most cumulative pressures going on. And it's the coastal areas that are essentially the vital organs of the ocean system. So it's these coastal areas, particularly estuaries where land meets the sea and where fresh water bridges the two that are the most important ecologically in terms of keeping ocean ecosystems functioning. And these are the places where we're ex exerting the most pressures. As a result, we have a situation where we have a dangerous cycle that's leading to degradation and ultimately the diminishment of human well-being. And that in turn feeds more and more destruction and degradation. And so we're caught in this kind of endless feedback loop. Now, my point today is not to depress you. <laughs> and I don't want to dwell on this uh, too much in terms of what we're, what we're doing and what we've done and um, how insufficient our response has been. But I do want to make the point that the typical response to noticing and observing um, and experiencing degradation is for governments to continue to practice siloed management, sectorally addressing one problem at a time, or to do what I call conventional co conservation, which is to essentially erect a fence around a marine area and hope for the best by restricting use. That leads to a uh, deepening rift between coastal communities and people depending on ocean resources uh, and, um, and the sea itself, I'm sorry, um, and a continued loss of biodiversity and the ecosystem services that flow from healthy, um, productive ecosystems. Now, I am not saying that marine protected areas and other conventional conservation measures can't work. And in fact, they're extremely important and they are have been shown to increase biodiversity, to increase productivity, uh, and even to cause spillover effects where neighboring adjacent areas um, are made more healthy and um, more productive. But this can only work in systems where ecosystem functioning hasn't been compromised. And unfortunately, what we have is a situation where many of our coastal areas are so degraded now that we can't turn to conventional conservation, what I call conventional conservation. We can stop, uh, we can mitigate the destruction with con conventional conservation, of course, and with active good management. But to reverse the tide of degradation, we really must practice multifaceted restoration at the scales appropriate to these enormous interconnected marine ecosystems. Uh -oh. Oops, <laughs> I'm not mastering this technology very well, I apologize. 
I also want to apologize for setting up what's really a false dichotomy. I know many of you are conservationists, you practice conservation, and as part of your conservation work, you are doing restoration. And I don't want to imply that conservation and restoration are, um, are separate from one another. But I want to create this false dichotomy to make a point. And that is that if we want resilient coastal systems that are currently very degraded, we can't rely on conventional uh, conservation tools alone, and we need to restore the health of these systems before we can turn to those tools to let nature recover itself. And here, when I say resilience, um, I'm talking about not just the ability to resist uh, change, so to um, uh, be healthy in the face of disruption, but also the ability to do it, adapt. Because as you know, ecosystems are changing very, very rapidly, not just because of climate change, but because of all kinds of um, large scale environmental changes that are occurring. So when we want sustained recovery, we need to harness both the tools of conservation and the tools of restoration. Now, I know it sounds a little bit like hubris to be, saying that we need to heavy handedly step in and take over. <laughs> and what I'm not implying whatsoever is that we have any ability or desire to control nature, but only that we take a look and first restore the environmental conditions that can let nature then thrive. Um, part of this can be attempting a kind of blue rewilding, so reintroducing species that have disappeared. Uh, but first and foremost, to understand what's led to the degradation and then tailor the solution to the problem um, that's at hand. And this may seem completely obvious and not worth even mentioning, but actually this kind of problem scoping is something that's very rarely done. And what happens is that planning agencies and management agencies will often reach for a solution before they even understand what the problem is. So um, in terms of trying to most efficiently and most effectively restore coastal ecosystems, there has to be an investment of time in understanding why did they degrade in the first place. And you might wonder, is this even possible? And I would say emphatically, it is possible. We do have a lot of knowledge, and this knowledge is not just scientific knowledge uh, of our traditional sort, but also user knowledge. So traditional knowledge, tr traditional ecological knowledge. Um, the knowledge base is ever growing. We still are very far behind terrestrial ecology in terms of understanding the ocean ecosystems, uh, but we are building that knowledge base we also have now a lot of experience in marine restoration. Admittedly, that experience are small scale projects, uh, none really to the scale that we need yet, uh, but we're building that experience and that knowledge base simultaneously. And we have a particularly opportune time right now. And that is because we have a lot of things going on simultaneously on the policy front that they're mentioning. Uh, we have a couple of UN decades of right going on right now. One is the UN decade of restoration. The other is the UN decade of ocean science. We have a brand new global biodiversity framework under the coming Montreal uh, agreement under the Convention on Biological sure. Diversity. This framework um, articulates a target specifically for restoration as well as a target for protected areas and for sustainable use. Uh, we have a new agreement for high seas areas, that is areas beyond national jurisdiction um, under the UN General Assembly, uh, under UNCLOS, the UN uh, Law of the Sea, which is called the BBNJ Agreement, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction. And that creates an opportunity to do conservation and restoration on the high seas. We have a lot of disaster risk reduction initiatives. Um, and these are often not mentioned in the conservation arena, but uh, these are super important in terms of 
uh, utilizing and building up uh, nature-based solutions. Um, we've got all kinds of negotiations and agreements going around on plastics pollution, and that will in turn open the door to other kinds of agreements around other kinds of pollutants that might actually be even more important to tackle than plastics, uh, like um, PFAS and other kinds of um, toxins that are affecting ecosystem function. We have also carbon and biodiversity markets, and these are expanding, and that's a subject for a whole nother talk. Um, and then in brackets, I put the climate change negotiations. Uh, of course, those are happening and are very important at the same time. But we have a lot of reason to think that there are frameworks in place and policies and targets and commitments that countries have made uh, to reach those targets, uh, which create opportunities for restoration um, all around the globe. Sorry, <laughs> I seem to have, I seem to have de-charged. Okay, this one's working now. So where does restoration fit into this? Um, and let me just say that um, when we talk about restoration, we talk about, uh, as you all know, because you are many of you restoration experts yourselves, uh, we talk about active and passive restoration. So I think about active restoration as kind of jump starting natural recovery. And I think of that natural recovery as the passive restoration. Uh, what Isabella Tree in her Wilding book called the self-willed ecological processes. So letting those happen. Um, but active restoration is, is often needed as a precursor to allowing the passive restoration to occur. Um, we have a lot of small scale demonstrations projects. As I said, we have restoration experience, uh, much of it small scale. Uh, those small scale demonstration projects um, show what's possible and they can be replicated and they can be expanded. So the, there are opportunities uh, in terms of on the ground opportunities, not just policy opportunities, but also site-based opportunities um, to get going on restoration at bigger scales. Um, but really what we should be aiming for and what a lot of these policies kind of imply and create an open door for is to embed restoration in everything that we do. When we do coastal development, we should be thinking about how to do that development in such a way that it helps nature recover itself, that we do restoration as a part of development. Uh, when we... Uh, when we think about uh, doing marine spatial planning, we should be embedding restoration into that. So we should be identifying sites where we can invest the time and money um, to recover nature and to give it a kickstart for her, nature to recover herself. So I do want to mention also that restoration is a long game. It's not an immediate uh, a thing that reaps immediate rewards. Um, and this is problematic for people looking for funding for restoration because funders are often interested in seeing results in three to five year timeframes. Um, restoration is a long game. It means, first of all, uh, changing the milieu of a particular site so that the environmental conditions are improved. That could be water quality um, and it could be uh, benthic conditions all of the conditions. Uh, it can also mean actively building structures to allow the restoration to happen. And that's kind of the quite literal foundation for restoration in the marine environment. Um, and then it also means actively restoring biota, um, including where possible rewilding. Um, and that's of course the biodiversity component and the thing that we care about most. And then stepping back to let nature heal herself and um, undertake the long road to recovery. I'm going to just mention very, very quickly, I'm going to fly through this very quickly because I want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, I want to tell you about two different examples from the Caribbean. Now, these are not um, examples that I would say are, uh, are demonstrating uh, best practices that can be applied everywhere. They're deliberately two very different examples to show you kind of different extremes of what I'm talking about 
when I say um, that active restoration is a way to kickstart natural recovery. So the first will be in Barbados. Uh, both are from the Caribbean, both examples. Barbados um, in the Antilles. Um, and the second example is from Mystique, which is in um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So we'll start with Barbados, um, the west coast of Barbados. Uh, and uh, the west coast of Barbados is an area where um, Barbados, which was once an agricultural uh, area and a very important colony for um, Great Britain um, because of its rum production, <laughs> uh, slowly over the past century has been transformed into um, largely a tourist economy. And the West Coast is an area with a lot of tourist resorts, um, as well as um, small towns and, and fishing villages and so forth. Um, the problem in Bar the problems, marine problems in Barbados are many, but in this particular site, uh, what was happening was an excessive loss of beach and shoreline erosion. Um, and I just point to these um, three uh, profiles from aerial photographs from 1950. This is a little bit deceptive because uh, this looks like it's beach, but it's actually just resuspended sand. This is during the north swells. So the beach is not as wide as it might look here with this white, uh, but it was quite wide. Uh, you can see in 1991 how wide that beach is. Um, and by 2015, there's almost no beach left. Um, and you can see also the transformation of the land. So going from agricultural area to uh, mixed agriculture and settlement uh, to a massively um, redeveloped um, land uh, with resorts and a lot of shoreline hardening also um, to the north. Uh, along the entire west coast, we see a pattern of loss of uh, shoreline. So loss of beaches, um, inundation um, over time. And the consequences of that are, of course, there's less value to the beaches, uh, which are very, very important for Barbados's economy. Um, there's direct costs to the tourist operators. Um, but very importantly, there's a loss of access for residents. Um, and Barbadians do spend a lot of time on the beach. Um, and it is culturally extremely important for them and less and less access uh, to the beach again, crowding tourists primarily into the remaining beach pockets and excluding local residents from a lot of the areas, um, just by virtue of the fact that there's less, less beach available. Of course, decre decreased habitat for things like shorebirds and crustaceans and nesting sea turtles and so forth. Um, increased risk of inundation and flooding and damage to infrastructure but not only that, but the increased inundation and flooding also means there's a lot more pollution getting onto the reef because when waters flood, they then recede and they take with them all kinds of heavy metals from the roads, uh, sewage, um, you know, you name it, plastics, <laughs> even large debris. Uh, so really big problem for the reef ecosystems offshore, not just um, for the, the coastal uh, floodplain. And that, of course, is leading to degradation of the nearshore reefs. And the degradation of the nearshore reefs then means more and more inundation, less ability for the reefs to buffer the land from storms and so forth. So to solve this problem, uh, Baird and Associates, was, which is a Canadian engineering firm, sorry, um, which has had a long presence in Barbados and has worked in partnership with the Coastal Zone Management Unit, um, which is a government agency in, in charge of coastal management. Baird came in uh, and did uh, a lot of um, studies to understand what was causing the beach loss and the shoreline erosion uh, and to tailor a solution to that problem. So part of that involved uh, LIDAR um, overflights and then this um, more highly refined CODA mapping which really gives you a three-dimensional uh, mapping of the seafloor where you can pick up individual uh, coral colonies. Um, amazing technology um, and very quickly um, done and uh, 
the basis for a lot of different modeling uh, that the engineers did. Um, Baird was also looking at um, analyzing the tides, the 50 year storm surge um, and sea level rise, as well as local sea level rise anomalies. And this is something that's a little bit strange is that you have pockets in places where you have the standard sea level rise, which is caused by the seawater expanding from warming, but also subduction of the plate, right? So if the land is going down, the sea le relative sea level is going up. Um, but you also have anomalies, which are these bizarre little pockets in places where the water just seems to rise up. Uh, and this happens predictably year after year um, in certain places. So Baird was looking at that as well. Uh, doing wave modeling to better understand um, waves and currents um, and storm surge. Uh, doing sediment transport studies because, of course, beaches are composed of sediment and sediment has to be delivered to the beach um, in order for there to be a beach. Uh, and sediment can't be washed away from the beach uh, if the beach is to be maintained. Um, also hydrological studies because the hydrology and fresh water coming in um, surface water as well as groundwater onto the reef is going to affect um, the stability of the shoreline as well as the health of the, the reef. So we have drainages on this site and we have also um, surface water uh, run in, runoff. Baird was able to look at all this and ascertain the reasons for um, the reasons for the uh, erosion of the beach, uh, and then build a physical model uh, to test the solutions to stopping the erosion of the beach. Um, and these physical models are kind of complex. They're done up in Canada. Uh, they involve um, taking the, the CODA data and creating a, a model. Um, so really getting the coral reef and the bottom topography exactly right. Uh, and then testing out different structures um, to see what will hold the beach in place. Um, this physical model actually had to be redesigned because what we noticed uh, right away when we were doing surveys is that the near shore contained a lot of um, a lot of uh, coral pavement, essentially, so dead coral, old coral reef, ancient reef that had been eroded out and had a lot of voids in it. Um, so this is like Swiss cheese or maybe I don't know maybe Havardi or some other kind of cheese with a lot of small, smaller holes, critically important for as fish nursery habitat. And something that um, typically when people see ancient reef, dead reef, they, they kind of pass it by and they go on to the living reef and that's where they do their biodiversity assessments and that's where they concentrate their conservation. But actually these dead structures, those dead reef um, now eroded out with all these voids, were inshore and where they initially thought to put submerged breakwaters to hold the beach. And we said, nope, don't do that. Let's not get rid of the fish nursery habitat. It's a limiting factor for fish populations in Barbados, but let's keep that and therefore remove the structures farther offshore to avoid uh, this dead reef area. Um, where the structures ended up getting placed, and these are submerged breakwaters, so they're not visible from, from the shore, uh, and they're not um, an impediment to some kinds of navigation. I mean, you can windsurf over them, but you can't uh, take a deep keeled boat anyway. But where these structures went in, there were a few small isolated coral um, heads, and those coral heads we moved and relocated to a nursery during construction. And then we brought them back um, and cemented them onto the breakwaters um, with an, a very high success rate, I'm pleased to say, uh, and a lot of subsequent growth of those corals on the breakwaters. Something we're working with now is to assess um, the design of these break, submerged breakwaters so they maximize coral sediment and also coral survival for those relocated corals. And I'll talk about that in a second. So this is what the structure looks like. Uh, these, um, these are not the submerged ones. <laughs> these are the submerged ones here and here. Uh, and these um, submerged breakwaters are um, holding this beach in. Um, you can see how wide the beach is now and um, 
how much uh, each is created. Um, and I, as I said, the breakwaters are designed in such a way so um, there are, are voids in the breakwater as well. Um, the, it's not a solid breakwater on the bottom, but there's gaps in between, uh, which are important for fish life. But also the planes of the rocks used um, are in such a way that it maximizes coral settlement. And so not only the corals that have been kind of pasted on there, cemented on there that were moved um, during the construction, but also new uh, coral colonies are immediately started um, growing on these um, breakwaters. Um, and the with the idea and the hope that in a matter of just decades, the breakwaters will no longer be visible and what will be there is a natural living reef um, with the support of these large boulders that are keeping the beach in place and, and doing that service artificially for the time being until the reef um, grows to the point where it can kind of take over um, and keep up with, with sea level rise. So we call this a, a green gray approach. Um, and it's, it's the physical environment that kind of sets the stage for recovery. So the shoreline stabilized, um, that has the benefit of you know, giving more space for turtles to nest, more habitat for shorebirds, but also less sedimentation on the reef. So there's less sand leaving the beach and going and smothering the reef. Um, there's less pollutants coming in uh, also because they also uh, are lessened by the shoreline stabilization and more nursery habitat. But I do want to mention that it's also creating an enabling environment for stewardship. Why? Because uh, people inquire and learn about these structures. They learn about the process of natural recovery. So once nature has been assisted in this way, we step away and we watch with wonder as the corals come back, uh, as the fish come and are attracted to the to the area as the um, area provides even more habitat for young fish and uh, increases the productivity. Um, and that creates opportunities for stronger connection, whether it's tourists or residents um, between humans and the sea. Um, and also it creates development opportunities for com the community in Spitestown, which um, has been kind of left behind in Barbados's development. I just want to quickly mention another uh, project in Barbados because the problem here is a little bit different. And I just want to quickly mention, um, again, Baird was called in to look at a situation somewhat to the south in a place called Whole Town, uh, where there was also shoreline erosion, uh, but a huge problem with water quality. And uh, apologies for, the, um, for this picture being out of focus, um, but you can see the beach is um, coming in and um, has been lost to the point where there's infrastructure now dangling on the on the edge of the water. Um, and this green strip here uh, is a, a creek that comes in um, and brings fresh water down from the mountain. Um, at times, uh, Barbados has these enormous precipitation events, just heavy monsoonal rains uh, during the rainy season. And when that happens, uh, the high elevation waters come crashing down, uh, bringing with them, of course, all kinds of pollutants um, and washing the sand away um, as the water flows through uh, out to sea. So um, Baird created a few things here. Again, submerged breakwaters, the two that you see. Um, and also um, on the right-hand side, uh, something called a fluidizer, which is um, a, essentially a culvert built into the beach, which allows the drainage of that creek across the beach. But it also does something, it, it modulates the flow of water. So that's one thing. So the flow of water is kept within that kind of culvert um, and doesn't take all the beach away, all the sand away with it and dump it on the reef. Uh, but the other thing it does is that it filters the water coming from the creek before it reaches the ocean. And it filters it, uh, just the sand itself acts as a filter 
to retain a lot of the heavy metals and pesticides and other pollutants that are um, that would be coming through and otherwise would be dumped on the reef. So the immediate effect of this was a great improvement in water quality in this localized area. And with the improvement of water quality and a lessening of the turbidity of the water, um, immediately these breakwaters started being colonized by corals. Um, so you saw um, these small colonies coming every, every year uh, and growing very, very quickly, even though these stony corals are not particularly fast growing, but see a lot of growth very, very quickly. Um, these waters are pretty nutrient rich. And um, so it allowed for good growth um, in the absence of these um, chemical pollutants. Uh, but the other thing that we saw was an increase in diversity. So we saw the kind of regular corals you'd see in cresting brain corals, for instance, on the boulders but also uh, things like this Acropora palmata, which is um, the elkhorn coral, which pretty much had disappeared from Barbados um, in the 1980s uh, and coming in all over this, um, these two breakwaters um, and taking a foothold again. So great to see. And then along with the, of course, the structures and the corals and the sponges, um, a lot of fish attracted to the breakwaters um, and reproducing there and using the breakwaters as a nursery habitat. So um, I'm going very quickly because I do want to leave time for questions and I want to get to the other example. Just want to say that I understand and you know, you must be thinking Barbados is kind of unique. Uh, it is uh, an interesting area that is um, an island that is highly, highly developed, urbanized, I would say. Um, it's also a place that's unique for positive reasons in that there's a longstanding um, coastal zone management um, regulatory body, um, very well understood ecosystems. Um, Baird has been working there for um, almost two decades now uh, and doing long-term monitoring. And one thing that Baird does um, in contrast to a lot of engineering firms in the world, I think, uh, is that it commits to doing long-term monitoring post projects. Um, this is in Baird's best interest so they can design solutions that are effective, uh, but it's also in the interest of Coastal Zone Management um, Authority and the citizenry of Barbados because it means that uh, we can truly see what's going on after these structures are built and how quickly nature recovers, or if there's a problem, we can monitor that and know that um, and, and, and fix it. Um, also Barbados is unique because University of West Indies is there and Surmes um, and people like Hazel Oxenford who have been doing long, long-term monitoring studies on the health of the reef um, and on different coastal ecosystems. So this is a unique case where there's a lot of knowledge that could be harnessed and a lot of interest and a lot of partnerships that set the stage for these kinds of solutions. Now, Mustique is completely different. Mustique is not densely developed. Uh, it is very sparsely inhabited by extremely wealthy people uh, who really care about the ocean. But I would say, um, if it's fair to say, I think uh, it, may, it may be that in Barbados, the beaches and the coastal ecosystems are more important to the Bayesians than they are to the mystique uh, population. And I say that, I'll probably get in trouble for saying that. I know this is being recorded, so I don't know. Uh, but I say that because uh, mystique is a, um, a kind of resort island or uh, uh, an island with private homes um, where the entire island is very well managed and um, where the environment, the entire environment um, is very important. So it's not just the beaches, it's uh, and not just the coastal areas, but the whole the whole of the landscape. Um, it's also uh, unique in that uh, Mystique is a place where um, there are, you know, there's ample resources to do development right uh, and to monitor and research and do restoration. So Baird was called in again this place. Uh, to um, 
fix again a beach erosion problem. Uh, in this case, this is Lansakoi Bay, one of the biggest bays in Mystique, very important for local landowners. Um, they put in a revetment along this entire bay. There's this revetment you can see. So basically hardening the shoreline for this entire bay. And I'm sure you all know that hardening the shoreline is never a good idea. <laughs> uh, they were subsequently very surprised when they lost the beach <laughs> on the other side of the revetment. Uh, and so Baird was called in uh, to fix that problem. And that problem was pretty easy fix. A couple of throw food groins um, on the beach uh, and a couple of submerged breakwaters. But um, the situation in Mystique, this was in 2009 when we went down to, to fix the beach. Uh, and I say we because I work part-time for Baird. So uh, if you're wondering why I'm saying we, it's because I, I do work with this engineering firm. Um, we went down and uh, essentially fixed the problem and landowners were happy, but uh, there was something going on uh, in the bay, which was disturbing to us. Um, and in some in one part of the bay, the breakwater uh, the breakwaters, there was still some erosion going on. I won't I'll say the breakwaters didn't work because the breakwaters weren't there, but uh, there was continued erosion going on, so it needed a little bit more of an investigation. Uh, and we one of the things that we do is um, sand constituent analysis to understand what's the sand made of and where's the material coming from so that we know what to do to enhance the production of that sand material. And in this case, like many Caribbean beaches, the sand is made primarily out of um, palamida, which is a calcareous algae. Uh, and halamida is uh, this one, this is the dead skeleton of halamida. Uh, and this is made into sand by parrotfish that come and graze halamida, primarily parrotfish. Some other grazers do this too. Uh, parrotfish are wonderful sand producers. Um, a single parrotfish will produce a ton of sand a year by excreting the sand out the other end. Uh, and so um, we know from, from the sand constituent analysis that this is, uh, Halamita is super important for Lansakoi Bay and for, um, for maintaining the beach. The other thing we knew about Lansakoi Bay was that it was historically an area of vast seagrass shallow water bay, vast seagrass, coral reefs on the far end, but mostly seagrass in the interior. Um, and these are two images, one from 2005, the other from 2016, that show the loss of seagrass. And the loss of seagrass was initially from um, the desalination outfall. Uh, Mystique gets all of its fresh water from desal. The desalination outfall was originally right here, right on the beach. So it's dumping um, highly salinated brine into the water. Uh, and slowly all the seagrass in this area died out. Uh, in 2009, we noticed that and we told the Mystique Company to move that outfall offshore, uh, which they did, but they only moved it to here. Uh, and so as a result, we had subsequent loss of seagrass at the outfall. <laughs> So uh, they have now moved that thing to where we said to move it originally, which was out into this deep channel. Um, and that will hopefully help with the seagrass situation. Um, but, uh, and there's a picture of the dreaded outfall. Uh, and you can see the high salinity uh, coming through. Um, there are other, situa other confounding factors that I don't want to take up any more time with this example, except that there's a lagoon behind the Lansakoi Bay, which has mangroves in it. And the other thing that we are recommending is that um, that lagoon opening be kept open now so that there's flushing of the lagoon waters into Lansakoi Bay and, and marine waters going back into the lagoon to keep the mangroves healthy and to have the mangroves do what they do, which is filter water uh, from pollutants and also provide nursery habitat for fish. So this again is a work in progress. Uh, there is seagrass coming back. Uh, the shoreline is stabilized, uh, but uh, there's a lot of work yet to be done. Um, 
So these two examples, again, not typical of situations all around the world. Um, they kind of represent two ends of the spectrum, um, but they are both illustrating the fact that you have to understand the problem before you can do active restoration and get the system to the point healthy enough where nature can start to recover itself. Now, in all parts of the world, these problems are multifaceted and they require a multifaceted solution. So it, in every case, in Barbados case, it's not enough that we stabilize the shoreline, obviously, or that we try and deal with localized water quality. If water quality is bad 100 meters away, that's going to be a problem. Uh, and um, this is groundwater um, pollution as well as surface water pollution coming in, as well as pollution at sea. Um, uh, Barbados needs to deal with fisheries issues and um, illegal fishing. Uh, it needs to deal with areas and uh, the health of areas offshore. Um, it needs to deal with how it cites future development, where and how much can it accommodate, um, whether it can reintroduce mangrove into places that have lost mangrove and seagrass into places that have lost seagrass and so forth. So all of these things are multifaceted, multifaceted solution required. And I just want to give a shout out to a special issue that Lisa and I are working on uh, of ocean sustainability that will showcase these kinds of multifaceted restoration projects at scale. Um, it's an issue that's going to be coming out uh, late this year, I think, <laughs> if we if we manage. Uh, and you'll see examples uh, where um, from places as diverse as the Solent here in the UK uh, to um, places in uh, the Western United States, uh, Pacific Northwest and um, uh, Turkey uh, in the Mediterranean and so forth. So uh, keep, keep an eye on that and uh, we'll, we'll let you know when that, that special issue is out. So this is the only way this kind of multifaceted complex solution to complex problems uh, is the only way we can break this cycle and turn it around and make it a positive. Um, and that's the only way that we're going to be able to then allow natural coastal systems to recover themselves. Now, the last thing I want to say, and then I'll take questions, happy to do that, um, is that there's a lot of pathways right now to sustained restoration. And by sustained restoration, I mean not just going in and fixing a problem, uh, fixing a broken part of the reef or fixing a eroding beach, but sustained restoration where we have natural recovery happening um, so um, organically and intrinsically in the system that it will continue. Um, those pathways include embedding restoration directly into marine spatial planning. Um, that's a topic for another lecture, but uh, marine spatial planning is happening all around the world. There is a directive in the U European Union, so all countries have to do marine spatial planning that have marine areas. Um, all around the world, countries are doing marine spatial planning at small scales, at national scales, um, and uh, we need to embed restoration into that planning. But we also need to mainstream restoration into all kinds of development, as I mentioned before. Um, we can take advantage of the BB&J agreement uh, and the Global Biodiversity Framework to get restoration going all around the world and to get fun, funds flowing to de particularly developing countries to be able to do this restoration, to be able to invest in the science needed to understand what the problem is and to tailor the solution. Um, we should utilize markets, uh, a kind of the green capitalism idea, uh, and, um, and look for private public partnerships uh, wherever possible to finance these inter interventions. Um, we should engage those that benefit from restoration in underwriting restoration, including supporting the research post-restoration the long-term research. And I should say in Barbados, the landowners have pooled their funds to be able to support this long-term monitoring with Baird um, to understand what's going on in many, many sites, not just the ones I mentioned. Um, and 
the last thing is we should consider the unintended consequences of certain policies and always beware of easy answers. The answers aren't easy, but they're doable and we are doing them and we will need to do them further. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And this um, only works for Hillary term, um, but I just wanted to put it there in case uh, you'd like to meet in person, I'd be happy to do that while I'm here until March 8th. Great. Thank you, Tundi. So we can take some questions now. Uh -oh. um, just to, okay. Tundi, where have we got to with carbon biodiversity credits for blue solutions? Not where we'd like to be, Charlie. <laughs> I mean, I think we're, I should have known you were going to ask that question. I think we are at the stage where um, there's been a flurry of activity around blue carbon. There's been a lot of pushback from the conservation community and civil society about uh, greenwashing and about um, about offsetting carbon in general as a principle that allows for further carbon and emissions. So just the general principle of markets and that kind of market failure, if you will. Um, but that said, carbon markets are expanding and uh, more and more projects are coming online. For many years, for a decade ago, the problem wasn't the carbon market uh, so much as the pipeline and the availability of projects to invest in. And um, despite Vera and, and um, other standard um, bearers that are um, have criteria for evaluating projects to be sure that the carbon is uh, credit is genuine um, and the investment is um, is worth it eff effectively. Um, there just wasn't there wasn't enough there weren't enough projects to um, well, to invest in. Biodiversity markets are something new. I know if you're in, you're one of the pioneers, so maybe you should answer the question on what's going on with biodiversity markets. But uh, biodiversity markets, not in, in offsetting biodiversity, but in investing in biodiversity as a business enterprise. So investing in biodiversity, at, knowing that biodiversity then pays back, um, an enhancement of biodiversity pays back, and. Um, one of the things that um, institutions like the World Bank are looking at is how can you couple biodiversity and uh, bl blue carbon or any other kind of market mechanism so that you don't go down these um, these kind of myopic avenues towards maximizing one service at the expense of others. Um, and I'll tell you an example of what I mean. In Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi is strangely a country that has the um, has the longest history of um, planting mangroves of any country in the world. You would never expect that in the Arabian Gulf, but that's the case. Abu Dhabi has been doing it forever. Um, the founding um, sheikh was uh, very fond of mangrove and created mangrove plantations all over. Now, Abu Dhabi, uh, uh, the Department of um, Environment, a jetty it's called, um, started doing mangrove planting for the purpose of blue car of blue carbon, of sequestering carbon um, over a decade ago. And they have these mangrove plantations. Unfortunately, those mangrove plantations are sequestering carbon uh, and they are able to demonstrate that carbon credits could be sold. Abu Dhabi doesn't need carbon credits, but uh, they did it as a demonstration. But the problem is that they have, you're using single species. They're planting these mangroves, you know, one every three meters in these grids. And in many places, the, mang the plantations are not even connected to the sea. So they're not offering the service of fish nursery areas. They're not stabilizing the shoreline or filtering water um, from pollutants, uh, but they are sequestering carbon. Now that's a, and again, I'll probably get in trouble for that. So uh, I'm, I apologize if I was um, uh, telling that story, but 
uh, again, so if we're maximizing one kind of credit at the expense of other credits, that is not a good path. And World Bank is now interested in um, finding ways to kind of mainstream blue biodiversity and get it in to things like the carbon uh, facility, which funds uh, carbon pro uh, carbon sequestration projects and that kind of thing. I think there's, I think the worlds are coming together, and the markets are you know, evolving as best they can with fits and starts and experimentation. And you can answer that question. <laughs> Charlie Burrell, this is of NEP uh, Estate and of Rewilding Britain. Great, Thank and other you. things. <laughs> Um, thanks, Tundi. Uh, thanks for taking us all to the Caribbean in your talk. Um, I I know you've been involved in in other work, kind of closer to home in in the Solent. Um, so Blue Marine Foundation is is leading a a large a seascape scale restoration project down there. Um, and that I understand you you've been there to see it. It's it's ongoing. Um, but I wonder if if you might say a little bit about. Um, what's exciting about the multi-habitat component in that in that particular project and, and reflect on some of the lessons learned and how that might connect with some of the aspirations you noted here on the need to really follow from uh, terrestrial uh, landscape scale restoration and to see that in the in the sea as well. Yeah so thanks for asking the question and I, what I didn't mention is the the kind of underlying paradigm to all these multifaceted um, complex solutions to complex problems is the idea of ecosystem-based management, that these ecosystems are all interlinked uh, and that understanding those linkages is critical to maintaining their health and, and productivity and biodiversity and so forth. So in the Solent, um, they have a multifaceted program. I don't have anything to do with the execution of the Solent or the design of the Solent or anything. Um, Charlie and I both sit on an oversight panel for the Endangered Landscapes Program, um, which is based in Cambridge out of the Cambridge Conservation Initiative. Uh, and that program funded um, the Solent project alongside other funding uh, that Blue Marine Foundation and others um, have gotten. Uh, but it's a very large scale project that involves a number of different activities, rebuilding, physically rebuilding the salt marsh and uh, this picture actually way back in the beginning, or I don't know, um, is from the Solent. Um, so they're rebuilding salt marsh, they're um, restoring seagrass um, and uh, with the, Salt marsh is actually physically rebuilding, planting, and um, physically putting in buffers um, and barriers to keep retain the soil um, until the salt marsh takes um, hold. For the seagrass, it's more of a kind of passive uh, restoration, a bit of planting uh, and seeding. Um, and then they're also doing active, uh, here we go. Uh, no, they're also doing active um, oyster reef uh, restoration. So they are building reefs, um, oyster reefs, um, actually in uh, some of the estuaries um, in order, I don't know where it is, Never mind. <laughs> take my word for it anyway. Uh, and so they're actively uh, dealing with the oyster reefs. But that said, so those are, you know, akin to other things that other people are doing all over the world, harnessing other kinds of um, tools to do restoration. But one of the things that they're doing is the Solon is probably the most heavily used body of water um, in, in the UK. And, uh, you know, it's an area of a lot of shipping and recreational use. Um, it, all, all kinds of uses, um, an urbanized environment on land. Um, and one of the things that they're looking at is uh, water coming into the system from rivers uh, and what can be done to improve the water quality. Um, also, um, you know, all kinds of things about what can be done to um, enhance uh, environmental education related to the project and how people can um, better understand what's going on in the soil and to better support it and be better stewards, um, including not just individual citizens, but also companies that operate in the soil and, um, and then can finance um, future restoration. And I encourage you to go to the website. Uh, 
to look at um, um, film, two, two films that were put together um, for the project. Um, very, very compelling, no, thanks. Uh, very compelling um, stories being told and they just uh, blew me away in terms of the production value of these short videos that really talk about the restoration and what is gonna be required in terms of time frame to really see the outcomes. Um, and it's uh, very inspiring. So thanks for mentioning it. And uh, it, it is the ecosystem-based management idea is the thing that underlies that. Um, Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I wanted to know in the in the case study, particularly for Barbados, it seems more relevant. Um, it strikes me that by increasing and enhancing the amount of beach available, whilst you've obviously outlined the the benefits for the the natural environment, there's a risk that actually you could end up increasing the human pressure in that environment. For example, with through increased tourism or increased human use, and there's no sort of safeguards or guarantees that show that increased human use will be at a sustainable level. So how do you guarantee that you find a sustainable use, human use balance for the new ecosystem that is created? Because I, I just have this, this thing in the back of my mind that often with these restoration projects, um, it depends who's paid for those restoration projects. And if the, the people paying for it are paying primarily to protect the beach for tourism use, then tourism is the maximized sort of output as opposed to nature. You, you alluded to that with the Abu Dhabi sort of uh, comparison. So how does that work for the, the Barbados case study? Yeah, really good question. And um, I, I don't disagree with you that um, creating especially uh, new habitat for the elites is not something that's sustainable and um, certainly not something that's just. Uh, but in this case, so I should have explained a little bit better um, that beach, uh, especially in the, well, both the whole town and the um, Haywoods Beach, in fact, the entire West Coast was um, always intact and always available for local residents. And um, the loss of the beach, I think, affected local residents almost more than the tourists. Uh, there are many secluded, uh, quite nice resorts in Barbados that st still have their beach intact and have a lot of man-made structures and have a highly artificialized, I mean, even this was artificialized. I mean, it's something that um, affects me a little bit emotionally when I see this because, you know, I would much prefer a wild coast and not to see man-made structures at all. But, um, but there are, you know, tourist beaches uh, uh, available only to paying tourists in Barbados. But this West Coast it, um, has always been open access for residents and it was residents that were getting squeezed by the beach erosion. So bringing the beach back, um, you know, gives them back the access um, to beach areas. Um, it also, uh, the, the development behind the beach um, has committed to um, educating their tourists um, that are coming through in the resort and uh you know i that will hopefully make some difference but barbados is really special because it is so highly developed that um and there is really no choice but to find these solutions for the entire coastline in barbados because if not barbados will be inundated and the reefs will all die off, the remaining reefs, which are not in good health, they will all die off if there's constant inundation and constant pollution coming back from, from the land. Um, so Barbados really doesn't have a choice. Uh, and I, again, I didn't want to make this sound like it was a typical example, because if you look at anywhere else in the Antilles, you have the situation that you're talking about. You have areas that um, you could do conservation very effectively. You could put in a marine park, you could give special access to residents and exclude tourists from areas to make it more just um, and to allow natural recovery without these kind of heavy handed engineering solutions. Uh, but Barbados and many other places actually in the world do need this kind of thing. And the choices are few and far between on, on what you can do. A great question. 
I I know if some of you want to escape and get to the drinks. <laughs> that was great. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering because you said you put in a stormwater drain in the Barbados one, correct? Um, I was just wondering how far upstream do you go when you're starting the process of determining what the right thing to do is in those situations? Because I know that in the UK, one of the ways that they're looking at reducing flooding is by damming more upstream or even the reintroduction of beavers. And yeah. in a place like Barbados, yeah. obviously that doesn't happen, but equally it's far more densely populated as you get close to the shore. So I'm wondering how how far back up you go, but also how you might mitigate some of the effects downstream if you go upstream. Yeah, there are um, there are projects um, more to this on the south coast um, that that deal with entire catchments and can and are trying to regulate some of the water flows from high up in the catchment. That's not possible on the west coast. The um, the drop is very precipitous. And the these rainfall events are very sudden and extreme rainfall events. So it's not like the constant flow of these. These creeks are almost dry in, in the dry season. Uh, and in the wet season, it's just, you know, there's nothing you could do. There's no nothing you could do to, to prevent the water from coming down. Uh, or nothing you would want to do actually, because you would completely transform <laughs> the creek and gorge um, landscape. Uh, but uh, on the on the bottom, the building of culverts that allow um, water to come through, not not like the fluidizer. Um, I'm talking about bigger culverts that are under go under the road, for instance, and under some of the infrastructure, um, and which trap large debris and that kind of thing, so it doesn't get out to sea. Um, but you raise an interesting question, and I'm going to make a kind of controversial point here. Um, in some cases, it's actually better to not modulate the water flow and to let it come out in a big stream. Um, and this is what something that the fluidizer does. The fluidizer um, filters the water before it reaches the ocean, but the water comes out. You know, it's not it's not damming the water somewhere and keeping it in a reservoir. It's letting the water out to see. If it comes out in a big rush, it actually goes far offshore in the surface waters and it never affects the reef. If it if you take the same amount of polluted water and you let it come out slowly over time, it sinks down and it goes and it affects the reef. So as much as people hate to see the very turbid plume of water during these rainfall events, what we know is that that, that water is going fast and quick out to sea and not affecting the near shore as much. Uh, so in that sense, you would want, we would wanna be careful about modulating the flow because um, you wouldn't wanna set up the situation where you had this kind of chronic pollution affecting the reefs all the time, unless you could filter it in every culvert mm -hmm. along the coast, which, <laughs> Thank you. Um, we'll do one more question here and then I have one online. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. That was a great talk. Uh, I'm just wondering about these green gray infrastructure approaches. What kind of uncertainties are there around that and scaling that? And what kind of things are you looking for in the monitoring that goes on afterwards? Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the scaling question is very important one. And um, these things are done on a, on a small site by site basis. Um, recognize but the engineers uh and it's not just Baird and I'm I know I sound like I'm a mouthpiece for the company but uh there are many environmental engineering and coastal engineering firms that are doing this kind of work and doing it well um they do always model the effect on adjacent areas to be sure that you're not for instance robbing sediment from one area and bringing it stabilizing your shoreline there and causing impacts on the other side so even though the scaling is quite localized small scale um, it's still taking it, you know, into account the, the wider picture of what's going on. Um, but uh, the not everything can be controlled uh, by any entity, even by the Coastal Zone Management Unit. Um, and so um, there are things like breaches of setbacks, which happen all the time everywhere, even in like police states. Uh, people will always 
breach the rules and try to get their homes or infrastructure closer to the water. And uh, and so you, you see that happening, for instance, which then impacts even the best design projects and can affect their efficiency and effectiveness. Um, in terms of monitoring, what what Baird is doing with the help of these landowners that um, help finance this and is first of all, creating a data set that they, uh, that they then hand over to the coastal zone management unit, but um, collecting data in such a way that they know it will be carried forward by the coastal zone management unit. So none of this very expensive stuff of building physical models and you know, doing that uh, or, or using a very expensive um, sensors to check everything um, as we would do when we're going into a site to better understand it, but rather just monitoring the basics. So monitoring tur turbidity with SETI di disks or turbidity meters, salinity, temperature, um, doing very simple agra biodiversity assessments. So looking at coral reef uh, organisms and looking at fish populations and doing those censuses twice a year. So not more knowing that um, whatever monitoring systems is in place is only going to be carried forward if it's simple enough and you know not so costly that the coastal zone management unit can afford to do it. Um, and most of these projects are monitored for four years following the project finished uh, finishing um, and some for longer. Thank you. And the other things I should mention that they monitor is use of the resources. So also sociological studies. And I, I really didn't talk much about uh, the human element and I apologize because that's I, actually something I'd prefer to talk about <laughs> than this, uh, but understanding how people are using the rebuilt beaches or the, the improved water um, in the coastal area, you know, how many snorkelers are going and uh, yeah, trying to understand that. Okay, we've got um, one more question online here. Um, let's see, so, so you mentioned that we must foster interdisciplinary um, connections and collaborations to solve these complex issues. So the question is, how do you think we can facilitate these interdisciplinary relationships and allow more opportunities for design, uh, designers or artists to get involved? So for context, the person asking the question is an, an architect um, and designer with a background in biology. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, well, artists to get involved, it reminds me of the talk yesterday. And uh, yeah, and I apologize for my my presentation, which was so unartistic mm -hmm. <laughs> and terrible. And my communication skills also are not that good, but um so to get artists involved is absolutely critical and it's a, a component of um, so when we talk about multi when i say multidisciplinary i mean trying to um, harness the natural sciences the social sciences um, the political sciences so um, particularly but also um, psychology and um, really understanding what human perceptions are um, and and understanding how to affect behavior or um, set the stage for good behavior, let's call it good behavior, um, to get away from a world where we're constantly enforcing regulations, but we're looking for a world in which there's compliance um, and that's coming from within as opposed to being imposed on people. Um, and um, part of that, so part of the perception piece and part of understanding how to affect behavior um, is to um, communicate in different ways. And uh, as we heard yesterday, science communication can only go so far uh, and showing graphs is fine and good for this audience, but not, not for the general public. Uh, and so um, being able to work with artists um, is, and other artists of all types, so graphic artists, um, as well as poets and, and writers and so forth. And Isabella is here, uh, Isabella Tree, one of the most prolific writers on, um, on rewilding and on, on nature. Um, so that's extremely important. And I should mention that the Endangered Landscapes Program um, in Cambridge 
um, does fund the artists in residence program with the restoration projects that they fund. So they um, open for proposals, um, many of the projects and those projects work with the restoration teams to design art projects that um, can either communicate the restoration project or can help forge closer links between communities um, and the environments that they live in. So uh, really important piece. Um, yeah. That's Great. Really and, and just concluding and picking up on that point, we have a, a comment from uh, the Solent uh, project lead who okay. shared online the um, the YouTube link. If, so if anyone wants to learn more about that. Oh, please. Um, I encourage you to restoration look at these project a little closer to home. visit the website. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Really good. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.